He was an officer who distinguished himself in two world wars and the Korean War. And while he may only be known as a string of initials attached to a misguided wildlife management program, his dedication and technical knowledge in the field of modern gunnery inspired not just the Australian military, but the militaries of the United States of America and the Republic of Korea. This is the continuation of the life of the officer referred to by Korean minister Yong Woo Kim as instrumental to promoting additional ties of friendship already existing between the Australian and Korean armies. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the finale of the life, service and legacy of Honorary Brigadier General Gwyneth Purvis Win Aubrey Meredith, whose 47-year military career was overshadowed by a two-month operation known as the Great Emu War. This episode covers his service in the Second World War and the Korean War. Over the past two episodes of this season, I've introduced you to the life of Gwynedd Purvis Win Aubrey Meredith, a professional soldier born in 1887 in Swansea, Tasmania. He had been a soldier since 1904 when he joined the Volunteer Tasmanian Rangers and was an officer within the Permanent Military Force since 1907. Save for a brief tenure in the Australian Imperial Force in 1918 for service in the First World War and military postings to diplomatic posts in England in the early 1920s, he had been a professional soldier for close to 30 years. That was when he'd been ordered to travel to Campion, Western Australia to participate in an event that is now known as the Great Emu War. During this rather extensive military career, he did take time to marry Gwendolyn Mary Nicklin on the 28th of April 1915, and the couple would welcome their only son, John Wynne Aubrey Meredith, the following year, and their daughter Desiree in 1928. Following his forays in pest management, he'd be posted to the Eastern Australian Seaboard to take up the position of Commander of Coastal Defences in New South Wales, followed by postings as the Director of Mechanisation and the Director of Artillery, before on the cusp of the onset of hostilities in the Pacific, he was posted to Queensland as Commander of Coastal Defences, Northern Command, in December of 1940, as well as being appointed to the Officer Commanding, 8th Heavy Brigade, Northern Command. From August to December 1941 and the outbreak of war in the Pacific, he would routinely travel between artillery positions at Bribie, Cohen, and even in his old gun positions on Thursday Island in the Torres Strait as part of his position as commanding officer of Fortress Headquarters, a post responsible for the maintenance and supply of various fixed coastal positions along the Queensland coast. Presumably due to the threat of Japanese aggression, he vacated the married quarters at Kingsgrove at the start of 1942, though it's unclear where his young family relocated to as he stayed close to the headquarters for the Brisbane Fortress Command at the St. Lawrence's College in South Brisbane. He would continue to occupy this position until the 18th of March 1942, when, at the age of 55, Meredith had risen to the post of Administrative Command of the Brisbane Covering Force for Special Duties, in addition to his normal duties commanding the Fortress Command. I have to take this moment to thank Graham R. Mackenzie Smith, author of the Unit Guide, The Australian Army, 1939-1945, for sending me the chapter of his multi-tone piece devoted to the Brisbane Covering Force. This was a unit that I hadn't even heard of before researching Meredith and could find even less information about it. The Brisbane Covering Force was established to defend the capital of Queensland to organise all fixed fortifications, coastal batteries and anti-aircraft emplacements as well as infantry and motorised units under a single unified command with the intention of repelling any seaborne landing at the islands leading to the entrance to Moreton Bay and the Port of Brisbane. In September of 1942, his involvement in the Brisbane Cavalry Force ended, and Meredith would resume his post as Fortress Headquarters Commander. And on the 25th of January 1943, he would formally join the 2nd Australian Imperial Force, though it would seem that this was purely for administrative reasons, as a lot of the fortress stations that he was in command of had been seconded to the Australian Imperial Force. He would continue to serve as Officer Commanding Fortress Command, which would have him routinely travelling between coastal defences around Brisbane in a post he would hold until the 12th of November 1944. On the 28th of November 1944, he would assume a new post as commanding officer of the 17th Australian Line of Communications sub-area. Line of Communication units were responsible for, as the name would suggest, the maintenance of communication routes connecting military units and their supply bases and headquarters. For Meredith, 1945 would see him in and out of hospital for the number of maladies, Though, much like his service in the First World War, he would eventually travel to the combat area after the war had finished 
in September and November 1945 when he travelled to New Guinea and on the 16th of May 1946, 59-year-old Meredith was placed on the reserve list at the rank of colonel and placed on the retired list on the 19th of April that year. You would think that close to 47 years of continuous military service would be enough for one man, but Meredith, not content with retirement, after attempts at other vocations, he accepted a job offer from the United States 8th Army to travel to Tokyo, Japan as a Department of the Army civilian. He would later be appointed to head the small arms section of the Tokyo Arsenal, and with accepting his post, he would serve from 1950 to 1952, during the early days of the Korean War. However, once the American-Japanese Security Treaty came into effect on the 15th of April 1952, which contained provisions that prohibited foreign parties from having any involvement in any official positions within the Japanese war industry, he went to Korea as a civilian Chief Inspector of Ammunition and Explosives, a position created for him by the 8th Army, and would hold this post for the remainder of the Korean War. In this role, he would miss his daughter's wedding, sadly, and this wouldn't be the only family occasion that he would miss, as his mother would pass away in 1954, where, quite curiously, he'd be listed in obituaries as being a colonel in the United States Army. From 1954 to 1956, he trained the Korean Army in ordnance duties, and would regularly travel to the frontline units and instruct them on proper gunnery practices, something he also did as the chief inspector. And for this, on the 5th of January, 1957, in recognition and appreciation of his exceptionally outstanding and meritorious service, he was awarded the Chumgu, Distinguished Military Service Cross, and the Ulchi, the Distinguished Military Service Medal. At some point in this period, Meredith was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, though I'm not entirely sure on who actually promoted him, as while Korean and American records refer to him as a retired Australian Brigadier General, the Australian Army, in correspondences relating to his ability to wear the Korean decorations, quite plainly states that he's never held that rank and was not a part of the Australian military at the time, despite repeatedly referring to him in those correspondence by that rank. In 1957, at the age of 70, for health reasons, Meredith retired once more and left Korea and returned to Australia. When he got back, he became the New South Wales Chairman of the Regular Defence Forces Welfare Association, as well as Chairman of the Australian Korean Society and Patron of the South East Asian Returned Servicemen's Association. In 1966, Meredith unsuccessfully ran for the Federal Senate for New South Wales as part of the Democratic Labour Party. He came third out of three candidates. On Monday the 5th of May 1975, at the age of 88, Gwyneth Purvis, Wynne Aubrey Meredith, would pass away. He would be cremated and his remains would be interned at the Northern Suburbs Memorial Gardens and Crematorium under a simple brass plaque that listed his second AIF service number and his final Australian military rank of colonel. He'd be survived by his wife Gwendolyn, who would pass away in 1990, his son John, who followed his father's footsteps and served in the Indian Army during the Second World War, eventually retiring at the rank of Honorary Lieutenant Colonel, who passed away in 2000, and his daughter Desiree, who decidedly followed her grandmother into the arts and performance uh, aspects, and she eventually married a RAF pilot, Bill McFadden, and at the time of recording, I haven't actually been able to determine her fate. Some records say she passed away, others say she's still alive. When I first started looking into the life of Gwynedd Purvis, Win Aubrey Meredith, it was simply to see what impact the Great Emu War would have had on an officer in charge of carrying it out. What I didn't expect to find was not only did it not adversely affect his career, but it wasn't even his most prominent achievement. And while the Korean decorations were the only gallantry medals awarded in his nearly 50 years in uniform, Gwyneth Purvis Win or Meredith is a shining example of a man who not only just did his job, but did so tirelessly and effortlessly and understood what is meant by service. And for that, I hope at least now that the shadows have been peeled back far enough to give him the proper recognition, and that he's more now than just a jumble of initials. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it, and it would help out the show, if you took some time to share this with a friend, or leave a review on Spotify, or Google Podcasts, or iTunes, or anywhere that you listen to podcasts, as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode, with photos, show notes, and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net 
and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening and catch you next time. Bye.